After looking through Itch.io, as I usually do to find interesting indie games, I found these three games which allow you to explore famous impressionist paintings from a first person perspective. I'll be completely honest with you though, I was a little disappointed by the execution. I mean, one of them seems to be running at 10 frames per second. The mouse just pops up every now and then. And the music is just not very good. Which is a shame because I absolutely love the idea of being able to engage and learn about art in this way. Imagine exploring these spaces in a high quality, with music accurate to their period, and perhaps a nice narration to comment on different aspects of the painting you're exploring. Since I don't believe these games do a very good job at this, I thought I would use these games simply as a medium which I can jump off of and hopefully teach you about Impressionism. And in order to do that, we first have to broadly know what Impressionism actually is. Imagine yourself in 19th century France, and the process of industrialization is in full effect. As you can imagine, this physical and material change is bound to cause some more metaphysical change and confusion. Social, cultural, and political. So, not too different from today. The Academy of Fine Arts in Paris, however, seemed to be set in its ways, accepting only more classically inclined works, great historical pieces with figures of Greco-Roman mythos, tried and true techniques that had been perfected ever since the Renaissance. They were all granted exceptional demonstrations of artistry and grandeur. But even this, impressive as it may be, surely becomes stale at some point. The realism movement at this time did have its edginess, and did help shake the waters a little. But realism was edgy in its subject matter, not necessarily in technique or aesthetics. I actually talk a little bit about realism in my Artistic Inspirations of Silent Hill video, if you want to check that out. Impressionism, however, was different in almost every way. First of all, Impressionists would generally paint directly on the spot with minimal sketching. But of course, nature does not stand still, and people, in their day-to-day -day life, most definitely don't stand still. So these Impressionist paintings are usually categorized by small, light, and quick brushstrokes in order to capture those fleeting moments of light, nature, and of course people. To some, especially as critics at the time, this might give Impressionism a rushed and unfinished look. But to me, and many other appreciators of this style, it gives it a fresh weightlessness and an unconcernedness with any expectation. And paired with its focus on light and brightness, seen in its colors, an overall pleasantness. It's as if the great historical pieces that dominated the Academy of Fine Arts causes us to breathe in its immense detail, symbolism, and grand imagery. But it's in Impressionism, however, where we can finally breathe out. The second most important quality of Impressionism is movement. Now, this should be fairly obvious since it's painted on the spot, without any posing or manipulation of its subject. Of course it'll capture movement. But this is also seen in the framing and overall composition of these paintings. They all resemble snapshots, taken very quickly to capture that specific moment. Not surprising since photography was of course very new and popular at the time. But take a look at this painting called The Plum by Edward Manet. It's such a natural and candid shot. The way she's very naturally slouching, the way she ambiguously looks off into the distance, staring at nothing in particular, holding what seems to be a cigarette which she hasn't lit, most likely forgot due to being lost in thought. We have no idea if she was waiting on a lover, a friend, if she worked at the cafe and was simply resting. Some people theorize that she was a prostitute. I'm not really sure why, but it, it doesn't matter. Because her representation here is easily relatable. You could say Manet, in this painting, truly captured life, in both its complexity and mundanity. And I think that's a good theme to describe the Impressionist movement overall. It's both complex and mundane. Lastly, let me try to explain the feeling of Impressionism in another way. In my own special, unique way. Take a look at this painting called La Absinthe, or The Absinthe Drinker, as it's known in the English-speaking world, by Edgar Degas. And this is the perfect painting for me to exemplify this because Degas was an Impressionist painter, but was very much influenced by the realists. So he wasn't a pure Impressionist, if there even is such a thing. And another reason is that many people, including myself, theorized that the plum by Manet was a sort of response to La Absinthe. La Absinthe is dark. It wallows in its own misery. It idealizes it. And there's great value in that. It's a powerful piece. But even though it is meant to be, I guess in a way, a piece of realism, I find that it's more a piece of philosophical pessimism. After all, pessimists do tend to consider themselves realists. Philosophical terms, I'm what's called a pessimist. Um, okay, what's that mean? 
and make it all by down to chuchi. What are you even trying to say? The plum, however, shows us, to my view, a true piece of realism. Because although this woman, in this moment, might be very troubled, it is but a single moment in her long and complex life. The world around her does not mimic her state of being in that moment. It moves along, as it always has, and always will. The world maintains its color. Her dress is still a vibrant and jovial pink, and her cigarette is still yet to be lit. I'll explain this in a way Zoomers can understand. This one is kind of like... Made me happy, made me smile, nice. And this one's kind of like... By the way, stop saying that I'm doing Family Guy cutaway gags. I'm not doing that. Thanks for having us over. Open Gundam stuff. The first painting we'll be looking at is Japanese Bridge and Water Lily Pond by one of the most celebrated impressionists, Claude Monet. Not to be confused with Manet, different guys. Manet did actually sort of teach Monet. They had like this group of artists and they would all meet up and go do art. You could say Monet is credited for the name of the movement, Impressionism, after showing his painting Impression Sunrise in Paris. A man named Leroy wrote a comical and negative review in his article, The Exhibition of the Impressionists. He said, Impression, I was certain of it. I was just telling myself that, since I was impressed, there had to be some impression in it. And what freedom, what ease of workmanship. Wallpaper in its embryonic state is more finished than that seascape. Clearly, he didn't like it, stating that Monet's work was merely an impression of a scenery. He thought it was unfinished, but the Impressionists proudly took up the name, and obviously, it worked to their benefit. But that is not the painting we'll be looking at. We'll be looking at his series depicting water lilies. Yes, series. Monet did over 200 paintings of water lilies. He would sometimes paint virtually the same angle of the same pond with slight differences in technique and style. It's absolutely fascinating. It's as if you can see his entire artistic process, what he felt worked, what didn't. Another fascinating aspect of these paintings is that as you look in chronological order, you begin to see the picture become more hazy and lose definiteness. This could simply be due to the passage of time. As Monet paints this scene more and more, he begins to implement a higher degree of abstraction. But a theory I quite like, and seems to be perfectly plausible, is that Monet began to develop cataracts very slowly. This is very much confirmed. But because the cataracts developed gradually, he managed to adjust to it. So the difference we see in his paintings might not have seemed so extreme to him. Cataract surgery was also a lot more risky in the 1900s and 1910s, and Monet was said to already possess a kind of skeptic fear of any medical intervention. Here's an interesting game you can play at home. Find a painting by Monet in a more clear, less abstract form, and then find another painting of his depicting the same subject, but after his cataracts had worsened. Then try to blur your vision and see if the subject becomes clearer. I feel like it works pretty consistently. Another slightly less commonly known but widely successful and influential series by Monet is his Haystack series. And I would actually recommend this series first over the water lilies to people who are unfamiliar with his work. It contains a very easily recognizable Impressionist style, and you can see much more clearly how Impressionists, like Monet, played with unexpected color to bring life to a painting in a way that, in my opinion, a photograph just can't. And that seems to be an underlying driving force behind this movement, traditional artists experimenting with what photography could not achieve. But looking at the game now, and one gripe I had with it in particular, is that they didn't do an accurate portrayal of Monet's garden. After all, we know what his garden looked like. It does have many staples of his garden, but I also would have loved to see his house in an impressionist style. Or maybe they could have implemented other aspects taken from other works where his garden is depicted. In a way, combining all of his paintings into this one experience. I will give them credit for this, however. I like the way they portray the water. It doesn't look like just some basic water. It actually has some character. And I think this is important because a really interesting part of Monet's paintings, at least for me, is seeing all of the different ways he portrays water. I feel like in every painting he shows his water just slightly differently, yet it's always so easily recognizable and understood as water. Anyway, let's move on to the next painting. I will again commend the creator of the game, this time for the subject of the game itself. Paul Gabriel is a very interesting choice, because he was not part of the group of Impressionist painters in France, which Claude Monet was a part of. He was Dutch, and he was part of the Hague School of Artists, which leaned more towards realism and was categorized by more somber grey tones. Paul did not adhere to this philosophy, however. He wanted to capture color and light, unlike other members of the Hague School. This is how he chose to describe the Dutch countryside, in a way that no realist would ever describe it. Our land is not grey, even when the weather is grey. He also called it colourful, juicy, and fat. And then, and 
whatever that means. I say he chose to describe it in this way because that's really what's happening here. The impressionist artists choose to see color and they choose to depict it in their art. The painting we'll be looking at is called In the Month of July. And what makes this painting really special is its sense of scale. Now, of course, there are many landscape paintings that do this very well, but this one is particularly interesting because unlike other landscape paintings, which achieve a sense of scale from larger than life structures, here, it's just a simple windmill. So that sense of scale comes from the tall canvas, which helps follow the windmill upwards, and also the extreme point projection, which seems to be even more extreme due to the natural formation of the landscape including the lake at the bottom. You've probably heard that mirrors can often give the illusion that the room you're in is much bigger than it really is. This can be seen in both modern architecture and in older architecture, like the Rococo style, for example. I believe the lake here is causing a similar effect. It's nearly perfectly still water, giving it this mirror-like quality, which really opens up the presented landscape and even helps elongate the windmill even more. To sort of prove my point, look at the water depicted in Monet's paintings. It usually doesn't have that mirror-like quality, making Monet's paintings more centered and much less open. In the game, they seem to have used the actual painting for the texture of the windmill, which I really appreciate, but chose to duplicate the windmill for the rest of the landscape, which we know not to be accurate to real life, since we have another angle of the windmill which the creator could have used as a reference. Again, the same issue we saw with Monet's garden. The experience still would have been okay if it wasn't somewhat ruined by the music. You would expect some Something like this. But instead, this is what you get. I don't mean to be too harsh on these games, I just feel like it's such missed potential. It's such a great idea that just hasn't been very well executed. And trust me, I would not be complaining if this was free. I paid for this. Not very much, sure, but still. Let's move on to the last painting. Pierre-Auguste Renoir was one of the main impressionists, you could say. He was inspired by the work of Manet, which we saw earlier. He was also part of the same artist group as Monet, and participated in that very same exhibition where Monet's painting, Impression Sunrise, ended up giving the movement its name. Although the event at the time was heavily criticized, Renoir's work was criticized a little less, and was seen a little more favorably. His work was a lot more accessible than Monet's. Impression Sunrise is quite an extreme example of the movement's more patchy, unfinished look. Renoir's paintings, although still criticized, didn't seem as purposely like confrontational, so you could say that maybe they came off as a more earnest attempt at artistic expression. I'm not saying that Monet's piece wasn't an earnest attempt at artistic expression. I'm just trying to place myself in the shoes of those art critics and trying to figure out how they felt. For example, one of the paintings he submitted, La Loge, or The Theater Box, depicts a young woman and man at the theater. It does have that kind of blotchy but vibrant impressionist style, but compared to Impression Sunrise, for example, it is much less offensive, for lack of a better word. And Renoir's work as a whole is a lot less offensive. His paintings of mundane life and his love for depicting feminine qualities was something the public already enjoyed since, perhaps, the Rococo period. But maybe you could argue even before that. Anyway, the painting we see in the game is called La Yol or the skiff, and it's an impressionist painting of two higher class women enjoying a boat trip. It's nice, but not exactly extraordinary. But the game is called La Sienne, and the environment in the game looks significantly different from the painting. It's lively and complex, while the painting is serene and simple. The location also seems completely different. Well, I believe the creator of the game had another inspiration which he doesn't really tell us about. Because he's a liar, a deceiver. He's not skibbity, he's not the Rizzler. His swag is down. He's down bad. What's going on with you? What are you talking about? You sound insane. I'm talking about the bridge at Argentel by Monet. And I again have to point out to the way Monet paints water. I don't know why, it's just so satisfying. I just want to drink the whole thing. I think it's this painting because, well, it can't just be the skiff. The creator says, visit Argentel in 1879, the year this painting was made. That's it. That's my conspiracy theory. Like I said in the beginning of the video, this game runs absolutely terribly. And look, I know I have a gaming laptop, but if I can run games like Red Dead Redemption, I should be able to run this, right? This environment is by far the most complex and most well executed out of all of them, however. So it shows that their future games might be a lot better, as I can see a kind of linear progression of skill in these games. This one is also the most expensive. I don't know if it's worth 3 euros if I can't even run the fucking thing, but hey, whatever. These games still gave me an excuse to make this video and to talk a little bit about art history, so it's all good. Impressionism in the end ended up being a starting point for other styles, most notably Fauvism. 
which seemingly takes Impressionism to its logical extreme, similarly to Impression Sunrise, a painting you could say was ahead of its time in many ways. I don't think any of us can deny that beauty exists. How to define it might be a harder task, however, so I don't think Impressionism has found beauty necessarily, but it is one of the many routes on our way to beauty. Thanks for watching.